Bon, je vais pouvoir commencer le séance cet après-midi. Alors, c'est une conférence, la conférencière invitée, euh, Sylvia Kouvé-Schnatter, et professeur à l'université euh, de, de Vienne. C'est un peu l'équivalent, d'ailleurs, à la faculté d'économie et de business de, de des affaires de Vienne. Alors, c'est une spécialiste de série chronologique, mais c'est aussi une spécialiste de la statistique balaisienne et du modèle de Mélan. Et elle a écrit il y a quelques années un livre de référence sur le modèle de Mélan. De Mélan. Et donc, euh, nous allons écouter sur le titre Flexible Statistical Modeling Based on Space Clinic Pictures. C'est bien. Thank you, Chil. Um, my French is pretty bad, but. I think it was a nice introduction, thank you. <laughs> thank you also for inviting me. And I'm going to try my only French um, sentence here. Um, merci beaucoup pour l'invitation à Toulouse. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here in France and to give a presentation uh, to an audience or to, to a country where many people have contributed to finite mixture modeling and some of some of the French statisticians uh, who made important contributions that their names will appear on my slides. So there, there are two types of models which are close to my heart. Those are state-space models, which is for modeling time series, and the other group of models are finite mixture models. And I got interested in finite mixture models by working with applied economists, like people in marketing, people in economics. So this is why I'm particularly interested in finding a way to actually make those models work. And as you will see during the presentation, one of the most difficult parts uh, when you work with finite mixture models is to decide how many components you actually need. So there is a, a strand of literature based on infinite mixtures. This is a very mathematical approach to, to mixture modeling and you need a lot of mathematics to do it nicely. Uh, the advantage of finite mixtures is that you kind of uh, choose the number of components and the um, kind of the, the message of this talk is that you can get closely to what people do by using infinite mixtures, by using finite mixtures and specifying um, a distribution over the weight distribution in, in, a, in a particular way. So I think this, this approach of, of sparse finite mixtures is, is kind of uh, coping with the, uh, this difficult problem of uh, choosing a number of components using the standard finite mixture tools. And you're going to see, in, in a certain sense, it's very easy. So my, my hope is when you leave this lecture hall, you will immediately uh, be able to apply this approach here. So just to introduce some, some notation here, in equation one, you see the definition of a finite mixture distribution. So this is the, the most easiest uh, model you can think of. So you assume that you have data, data y, and they are drawn from a mixture of, so you have these component densities here, and the de definition ones assume that the distribution family is the same in each of those um, components. Um, but the, as you can see here, what changes between the components is the parameter theta k. So this is a distribution family. Theta is the parameter indexing this distribution family, and this parameter is allowed to change. Theta k goes from 1 to k here. Uh, we see during the talk the weights we have in this mixture uh, that play a very important role here. Um, the difficulty with choosing the number of components is uh, easy to understand. So consider, for instance, this mixture here and assume that you have k components. Now you can add an additional component, k plus 1, in two ways. One way would be just to add a mixture component where the weight is equal to zero. So from, from this very simple explanation, you probably see that the number of components is not well defined. So by adding an empty component, of course, you have an additional component. Or another way to, in, uh, to increase the number of components without changing the, the distribution here would be to split one of those components. So take, let's say, the last component, 
the weight is eta k, capital K. You split the two weights in any way you like, and then you duplicate the components, and then you end up with a mixture with k plus one components. So you see, the very definition of, of k is kind, kind of, it's, it's not very clear. And we will see that this has consequences when you do estimation, in particular when you're dealing with an overfitting mixture. So by overfitting, I mean that the, so you have data generated, let's say, by K2 components, and you fit a mixture where K is bigger than K2. Um, and you will see that uh, the, the inference for this type of mixtures is getting very complicated because then it will not be easy to, to separate between mixtures where you have empty components and mixtures where you have duplicate components. So for those of you, I don't know whether everybody in this audience knows about mixtures, uh, for those of you who haven't heard much about mixtures before, uh, a simple example would be finite mixture of normals. And as you can see here, there are two examples of this. The example on the left-hand side shows you that by combining two normal distributions, um, you get kind of an interesting uh, distribution here, which is flat on top. So on the left-hand side, you kind of see that you can use mixtures of normals to approximate more general densities. And on the right-hand side, you see a combination of two mixtures of normals which are kind of separated. And this, this might be a good model when you're interested in clustering. So when you use mixtures, we see uh, we then introduce latent allocations and the allocations makes it possible to kind of, of cluster observations here. So this is kind of uh, some propaganda for finite mixture models in case you're, you're still not convinced that they are useful. Uh, so people have been using them to, to capture, uh, as I said before, I work with people in marketing and economics. Um, so the, those data are very, very non-normal. So you can actually use finite mixture models to capture skewness, kurtosis, or multimodality. Um, in particular, interesting are applications where you have unobserved heterogeneity, which is quite common in economics, marketing, and also finance. Um, and they have a nice extension when you deal with time series, mo time series models. I'm not going to talk about time series models today, um, but you can apply them to time series uh, mixtures of state space models and things like that. Well, she mentioned this book. It's just I put it on throw it into my slides in case you don't know the book. So it appears 2006. So as I said before, uh, there are several challenges in finite mixture modeling. Uh, one of them, of course, is to identify the number of components. Uh, there is another uh, difficult problem, but I'm not going to talk much about this when you want to identify the component parameters. Um, let me go back to the, the first equation here. Uh, when you think in, in the marketing applications, you want to segment uh, the data you have. You want to find market segments and then you want to understand customers in, in this particular market segment. Then you're actually interested in learning about those parameters, theta k here. So this is what I mean by inference. Um, and one difficulty is the, the so-called label switching problem. So you, when you look at this equation one, you just can permute the components. So there is no unique relationship between the parameters and the component, and this is known as the, as the label switching problem. So I will only talk shortly about the uh, label switching problem. Uh, when you just want to use finite mixtures for density estimation, then you don't have to care about these issues because then you just use a mixture with many components do your estimation, and then you use the, the predictive density to describe the data. So what I'm going to say is particularly of interest when you are actually interested to identify the number of groups and to make inference and identification uh, within the different groups. I'm Bayesian, as Shil said. I think Shil is still convinced that you should do maximum likelihood estimation for finite mixtures. Um, 
One of the, the, the person who did the Bayesian approach for finite mixtures using modern uh, simulation technique was Christian Robert. So this is, I just, there are so many papers, so many people did Bayesian estimation for finite mixtures and the, the, this paper by Diepold and Robert in 94 was a very seminal paper to show how to do a Bayesian approach. Um, I think the, the last bullet here is the most important why would, you be, why would you want to be a Bayesian in the first place when you do finite mixture estimation? Uh, we've seen in a minute that the, the likelihood function of a finite mixture, in particular if it's overfitting, is a very ugly subject. And the, the prior distribution here is not that you say, well, I'm a Bayesian, but I want to be very non-informative. On the, on the contrary, by choosing the right prior distribution, you, you, you regularize the, the likelihood function. So if you don't like Bayesian methods, you can uh, listen to the talk and obviously think regularized likelihood estimation. So this is more or less the, the same here. So uh, I think it's, it's really important here and useful to be uh, informative by, by the prior choice. Uh, when you do estimation of mixtures, practical computational methods, People have been using uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods for many years. Uh, in particular in France, there are a lot of statisticians who think that Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, the simple, the simple ones, don't work properly. So I don't want to go into that issue. So you can use sampling-based methods to do joint parameter estimation and classification. And I will have one slide later on showing you how to do this. So the advantage, of course, when you do, now from a computational point of view, when you use sampling-based approaches for finite mixtures is, for instance, that it's so easy to obtain standard errors. Uh, this is when, when you use the M algorithm to estimate a finite mixture, it's very complicated and, and a challenge to get standard errors. And when you do Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, you can immediately compute standard errors. So I hope this was not too much Bayesian propaganda, but this is, what I, this is actually what I believe. So um, you shouldn't curse in particular if you're not an American, but the likelihood function is held for overfitting mixtures. So this is a, a picture from, from my book where it's a very simple example. You just have your normal data and you try to fit a mixture with uh, two components um, and this is what the, what the likelihood function looks like. I mean, you have those duplicate modes. This is the label switching problem here because you have two possibilities of arranging the components here. But apart from that, you see that the, the likelihood has many local modes. It's very, very non-regular. So this is what the, what the likelihood function um, actually looks like. And it's, it's not so easy to... There is, there are mathematical papers showing that one of those modes of the many modes in the likelihood function in the long run is a consistent, yields a consist, consistent estimate of the parameters. But in practice, when you do numerical methods, it's very difficult to identify which of the many modes this could be. So just to understand, I said it in the very beginning, why is the, the likelihood so, so a strange object? And as I said before, in particular when you're dealing with overfitting mixture, and this is what, what you would like to do, like in a regression model, you would start in the beginning with a lot of covariates and you would like to learn from the data which covariates are important and it works nice in, in regression analysis, all of you know that. And you would like to do something similar with mixtures, start with an overfitting mixture and hope that the data are going to tell you um, if you need less components than you allowed for in the very beginning. Um, and the, the likelihood, of course, there is the information in the data when the mixture is overfitting, but the likelihood actually has two ways of uh, dealing with overfitting. And, and, and one way is to make some of the components empty, which means uh, that uh, some of the uh, weights, eta k, are shrunk towards zero. Um, and in this case, the, the parameter of this particular component is then, if you do a likelihood approach, it's, it's not identified. Or when you do a Bayesian approach, it's identified only through the prior. So when you have an overfitting mixture, there will be many uh, mixtures where you have a high likelihood over zero weights. 
And on the other hand, as I said before, if the likelihood is overfitting, then the likelihood function will kind of uh, duplicate components, so it will shrink the difference between two component parameters towards zero. And in this case, it's just the sum of the weights which is identified, as I said in the very beginning. And those two ways are kind of uh, in a conflict with each other, and this is the reason why the, the likelihoods look so, look so strange here. So here you basically have the, the weights, uh, the, the solutions uh, with, uh, with zero weights, and, and the other part is the duplicate components here. So uh, when we do a Bayesian approach here, of course, we have to choose priors. So uh, the next few slides will focus on the prior on the weight distribution. So uh, we, we assume, and we'll talk about this later on if time permits it, we assume that the, the component um, parameters are drawn from some base measure. Let's call it G0. And let's focus for the moment on uh, how to model the weight distribution. Uh, it's very popular to assume a uniform prior on the unit simplex. Uh, in a sense, you would say, okay, the best thing I do is to have a very completely flat prior. Um, and this is something uh, that you should know when you do Bayesian inference. Seemingly uninformative prior, I mean, this uh, sounds very uninformative. Having a uniform distribution over all possible values sounds very non-informative. Uh, but sometimes uh, non-informative priors turn out to be very informative in unexpected places. This is because you don't have invariance here. I mean, the, the likelihood function is invariant when you make parameter transformation, but a prior um, is not. And the, the prior distribution on the weights is a Dirichlet distribution. Um, and the Dirichlet distribution has these uh, K hyperparameters here. And it turns out that the choice of these hyperparameters is uh, very informative, in particular for, um, for overfitting mixtures. And there's this very nice, and I think it's one of the most important papers people have written about uh, finite mixtures in the past year. Judith Trousseau and Carrie Mengelson, it's in a paper in GRSSB, um, where they do very nice mathematics showing that the um, hyperparameters in the Dirichlet prior, and I will consider now a special case where the, all these eight Ks are assumed to be same, the same, so it's just a Dirichlet prior, so I use this uh, simplified notation here, so we have just one hyperparameter here, and this is this very nice paper uh, which shows that this prior actually helps the likelihood to decide how to, how to react when the mixture is overfitting. So let's small d denote the, the dimension of the parameter. Is this? No, it's not me. No. <laughs> uh, so let uh, small d denote the number of parameters. Let's, no, it's the dimension of the component specific parameter. So when you have just mixtures of univariate normals, d would be equal to two. When you have bivariate mixtures, d would be equal to five and so on. You just count the number of parameters, the dimension of the compo component-specific parameter. And the, uh, she did, as expected, does very nice mathematics here and gives a, a full formal mathematical proof that in, in cases, um, so by choosing this a naught, a naught in the prior on the, on the weights, if this is smaller than d half, where d is the dimension of the component-specific parameter, then asymptotically the posterior concentrates over region which handle overfitting by leave, leaving the exact number of components empty. So k, k true is the, the true number of components, capital K is the number in your overfitting mixture, and asymptotically you actually learn from the data that you have too many components, and those components in asymptotically will be empty. And on the other hand, when you choose E0 uh, larger than D half, then asymptotically, uh, the posterior density will concentrate over regions where you have duplicated components. Um, so the idea of using sparse finite mixtures uses this first case, and, and you see you just have to choose 
the E naught in your Dirichlet prior small enough, and then asymptotically, you will learn from the data which of those components are empty. And this is the the idea um, I, I have been pursuing now for about two years. So there is um, a small paper. So there's a um, Christian Robert and uh, Mike Titterington and Carrie Mangerson organized a workshop on mixtures in Edinburgh. And uh, these are the proceedings which appeared in Wiley. Uh, so you find a, a bit about how to use this to do inference in that small paper. And uh, the, the philosophy is to decide through the directly prior whether you prefer empty groups or you prefer the applicated component. Um, and in, in, by doing this, you kind of um, help the likelihood to decide which, which way to go. Uh, we've been playing around with this idea. So this is the asymptotic result, is the half. Um, and I'm going to show some examples later on. Uh, to obtain sparsity for, it's an asymptotic result, d half, but to obtain sparsity in, for real data analysis, it turns out that E0 often has to be much, much smaller uh, than d half in, in finite uh, samples. So I'm not giving you a for, very informal definition of a sparse finite mixture model. I'm still working on the paper, and I, I hope it's going to be more mathematical than what we have on this slide. So what I mean by a sparse finite mixture model is a finite mixture model where the number of components is overfitting to two number of components, uh, where we have a hierarchical prior on the weight distribution, and the, the E0 uh, is, a, is a hyperparameter. So we see later on um, it's, it's important to, to be uh, very infor uh, rather informative on the, on the E0. So we could either choose a beta distribution over, over this region where you allow asymptotically for empty components or any other prior which concentrates on values smaller than d half. And the, the, the very idea is it implies sparsity, empty components are priority. So when you, when you do this, of course, you want to learn how many components uh, you have in your, your data how many different components. And um, when you use this concept, the true number of components is the number of non-empty, uh, non-identical components. And given what I said before, there are basically uh, two, two ways to go along. When you want to use uh, the marginal likelihood or reversal jump MCMC, in order to, so do you, you maximize, for instance, the marginal likelihood, or you look at the posterior of K in your reversible jump MCMC, and in order to obtain a good estimator by using the, 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 the posterior mode here, this makes only sense uh, when you uh, deal with overfitting mixtures with, uh, who have duplicated components. Because otherwise, if you, uh, use a prior where you have empty components, then you will select a K, but it will turn out that many of these K components are empty. So you kind of have to decide also when you decide which prior on the, on the weights to choose, you also have make, to have make, make a decision whether you want to do a marginal likelihood estimation or whether you, you want to um, do something else. And what I'm, I'm doing here is to um, use in, in the context of the sparse finite mixtures the, the number of non-empty <coughs> components as an estimator for the number of components in the mixture. So there's a nice annals of statistics paper uh, by Agostino Nobili who does, who does exactly the same here. So how, how do we learn about the number of non-empty components? This is here a single slide where we do MCM, how we do MCMC estimation. So it's basically switching between estimation when you know the grouping, when you know the allocation, and classification when you know the group-specific parameters. And when I have the classification, then I, oh, I'm sorry, uh, then I can use this information. So I do MCMC, so I have a, lot of, a whole sequence of allocations, and for each draw I can count how many non-empty groups uh, do I have in this way posterior distribution of the number of non-empty non groups and I use the posterior mode estimator then as an estimator for k naught. Okay. 
So this is just simulated data because we know what, what we have to expect here. It's a three-dimensional, uh, no, uh, sorry, a six-dimensional data. So the true number of component is four. What we have, so the, the D is, uh, is 27. So in this case, when we choose the uniform prior, it is a, it's a sparse prior because it's much smaller than 27. So on, on the left-hand side, we have the sparse finite mixture, and on the right-hand side, uh, we have the, the prior, which kind of forces, when it's overfitting, duplicated component. So let's look, for instance, at the number of non-empty components. You see, when you uh, allow for duplicated components, the, the, the number of non-empty components uh, increases. When you allow for, when you look at the sparse finite mixture, then you see the moment you're overfitting, the number of non-empty components uh, stays um, on the level of four, and this is the, actually the true uh, number of components here. You also see here, when you, when you use the sparse finite mixture, the marginal likelihoods uh, would overestimate the number of components. So, uh, kind of to, to wrap this up, when you, when you use the sparse finite mixture, you should use the, the number of non-empty components to estimate the number of components, or when you use duplicated components, you can either use the marginal likelihood or reversible jump and CMC, but you shouldn't mix the two of them. So, let me see about time. Yeah, I, I said, I mean, there is, uh, when you have selected a number of components, you want to identify the component-specific parameters. And I'm doing this in a particular way. It's kind of related to what Shil has been uh, doing in, in some of his papers. I do a clustering in the Markov chain Monte Carlo draws to identify uh, the, the component-specific parameters here. And by this classification, then I get a permutation with ha which is able to well, reorder and in this way identify the mixture. So if you're interested uh, in hearing more about this, this is this contribution in the, in the mixture book edited by Christian and, and his, his co-authors. Uh, I would like to make a comment how finite mixtures are related to infinite mixtures. So the main difference between finite and infinite mixtures is that the, the sum here goes to infinity. Uh, when you do infinite mixtures, of course, you have to make sure that the weights sum to one almost surely. Um, and people usually do this in a way that they look at, they look at what is called the stick-breaking representation of the mixture weights. Uh, so the, the first stick would be equal to the first weight. Now when you look at the second weight, this is what remains after you uh, removed the, the, the first weight here. And then this is, what, so you can imagine a stick of length one. You cut off the first weight, then what remains from the stick. And then you cut off another piece and you go on like that. So this is just a different representation of, of mixture weights. And the, the, the famous Dirichlet process prior, which is an infinite mixture, defines those sticks to be drawn from a beta distribution. And it's, it's interesting to see when you do finite mixtures, uh, you have a similar stick, rep, uh, stick breaking representation, but because the, the mixture is finite, the expected length of the stick you break off is kind of I increasing. But nevertheless, you have a similar representation as a stick-breaking prior, where you draw the stick from a beta distribution. And I, I added this slide just to give you the impression that basically when you use, when you draw, so when you do infinite mixtures, you draw the uh, component-specific parameters from a baseline measure. And we do the same in finite mixtures. So if, if those two distributions are the same, the only difference between an infinite and a finite mixture is the way you draw the, the sticks and they are drawn from a beta distribution and, and though those prior, these hyperparameters in the beta distribution, that is what, is what is different here. And there is a kind of, of unifying approach where you don't have to care whether you have a finite or an infinite mixture. So you, this very general class of stick-breaking priors, just assume 
that you uh, present the weights in the way I've shown before and the sticks are drawn from a beta distribution. And then it turns out there's something like a generalized theory clear distribution. If you don't know that, I mean, I haven't known it either before I started to get interested in this work here. So it, the, the posterior distribution, the prior and the posterior distribution of the weights themselves have this generalized theory clear distribution. And when you do your MCMC, instead of drawing the weights, you would draw the sticks and you see here, this is the posterior distribution of the sticks, so those two parameters are the hyperparameters of the prior. Uh, but here is the information of the data. So you see, just to a high degree, the posterior distribution of the sticks is determined by the data, and the only difference between finite and infinite mixtures lies in, the, in this hyperparameters here. So this is why when people compare, um, or when I started to compare finite, those past finite mixtures with directly processed prior, that I kind of saw for uh, applied data, it doesn't make much of a difference. And I think this is, uh, this kind of putting both of them into one framework clearly shows that there is not that much difference between the sparse finite mixture and the infinite mixture. I simply think it's easier to do uh, the estimation here. So um, I have two examples here. One example is model-based clustering uh, based on multivariate normal uh, distribution. So you have multivariate data and you use a mixture of multivariate normals to do the clustering here. So the, 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 this is the dimension of the parameter which can be uh, pretty high here. I don't know if, if time permits, um, this is the, the, the usual standard prior and we are having an extension of this prior so let's see if I can talk about this uh, at the very end of the talk. So this is a, a recent paper we have written here, we just submitted the paper so we wanted to see whether we can uh, do clustering using overfitting sparse multivariate mixtures of normals. Um, of, as I said before, we have to choose the, this AE naught, this um, uh, Dirichlet, this hyperprior, the uh, hyperparameter of the Dirichlet prior. Um, I forgot to mention that the, the finite mixture kind of converges to the Dirichlet process prior when you choose A naught in a, in a particular way. Um, and this choice of, of uh, hyperparameter for A naught. Approximate the directly process prior, so we are very close to using an infinite mixture. So we we use a finite mixture here. So um, I we start with a simulation study because here you see uh, what to what to expect. So this is uh, let me see, it's four dimensional and we have four mixture components here, and uh, we will compare to weight distribution one weight distribution where the weights are the same and the other one where we have a small component here. And we have a thousand observations, which is quite a lot, but many data sets are like this. Uh, so what you see here is the, so we are dealing with overfitting mixtures. So this mixture has 30 components here. What you see in this column is the estimator you get from, from the sparse finite mixture approach. Um, uh, I didn't mention this uh, specifically, but when we do the estimation, we stratify the uh, MCMC draws and select the subgroup where this number of components is equal to the selected number of components. So this column M0 shows you how many posterior draws are equal to have a number of four non-empty components here. And then we use this subsequence to do component specific inference here. Uh, but the nice thing here is that you, uh, independent of the degree of overfitting, you find the true number of components here. Uh, what is kind of interesting, so let me see, D, D was equal to four, so this would like be like 14 or, or 12 parameters here. So the asymptotic result would tell you E0 could, should, should be smaller than six. So we do a Bayesian inference here to find, so we say we want to have a sparse finite mixture, 
Um, but we use a hyperprior to estimate E0, and you see E0 is much, much smaller than the asymptotic D half, and it's kind of interesting. It, uh, you need more and more, so the, the value is smaller, the more component allows here. So the, um, it's kind of, of important when you use this sparse finite mixture to, to adapt, so it's an adaptive um, uh, approach here, to adapt to the, to the data here. So when we look at the, at the other simulation studies, so we fill in a very small group, so only 2% of the data, which is quite a lot when you have 1,000 data, uh, to see uh, whether this group is identified or whether this group is not identified. And also in this case, so th those are the overfitting mixtures here also in this case we were able to find those, those four groups. So we have some uh, well-known data examples in, in that paper, and I just picked the, uh, the CRAP data here. So those are only 200 observations, um, and there are four clusters. So the, here the classification is known. We, of course, use uh, model-based clustering, which is, an, is unsupervised clustering here, so we don't use the information that we have four clusters. And again, in this case, um, you see, so this is, this is the case, this is kind of the oracle property. What would you obtain if you knew how many components uh, you had? And those are the, the overfitting mixtures here. And this is the misclassification rate. So the misclassification rate is 8%. And you don't lose by having an overfitting, by using an overfitting mixture. So it's, you're actually able to, to learn from the data the, the number of clusters without having to pay a price here in the sense that the misclassification rate uh, heavily increases. So, about 10 minutes, Jill, or yes. something like this? Okay, I guess I'm going to skip this. So just to, to show you the results we, we have when we do the identification. So in, in this case for the crop data, all our draws <coughs> In, in our uh, sparse finite mixtures had actually four components and then we used this, this clustering method uh, here to identify the, then the four groups. So this is the, the, the idea of uh, dealing with the label switching problem because here you, you don't have the component specific parameters, you just uh, have all overall draws and then you do the clustering to identify the four groups. So the, the second example is, is, it's not in that paper I just mentioned before, this is work in progress. It's an econometric application, the Phillips curve where you try to explain the inflation rate by different uh, macroeconomic uh, variables. Uh, important one is the, uh, the unemployment rate <coughs> and there's a lot of discussion going on whether there is a switching in this data, so whether there is heterogeneity or where you have uh, a single Philip curve, so those are actually this kind of time series data because they go from 94 to 2012 and the, the model uh, I'm uh, explaining on the slide is a, is a dynamic mixture regression model. So we assume that at any point in the time our data are generated by a mixture of regression model and dynamic because we use the past values here um, as a predictor. I decided to show you this specific example because in this example, uh, this example kind of compares the three different approaches we have to select a number of components. So one of course would be to use the marginal likelihood and as I said before, when we use the marginal likelihood, we have to make sure that an overfitting mixture allows for duplicated component. We have to avoid empty components because the estimated number of components would refer to a mixture with a lot of empty components, and that's, this is what you don't want. So when you do marginal likelihood estimation, you would actually choose E0 bigger than uh, the, the, the bound by, by, by Shiditun and Kerry. So this is what I choose here. On top, uh, there is the, the finite, the sparse finite mixture model. Uh, in this case, I even use a uniform distribution over, over this region, which gives you sparse 
a sparse mixture in the limit. And here I also added what you get when you use a directly processed prior. Uh, so again, I had the uniform distribution on this region from 0 to 5. And when you do inference between the, the degree of sparsity you need here, like in the previous example, so you see the posterior, the, the posterior mode is around point, uh, 0 point, 0 point zero 0.02, so which is much, much smaller than the upper limit, which would be equal to 5. So I don't know, I don't know much about asymptotics, but it seems you're still very far here from, from, from the asymptotic. So those are only 100 data, so it's, it's a small data set, of course, here. Yeah. Uh, this is also kind of interesting because it, those are the three approaches you could have to select the number of components. So this would be what you obtain uh, by a sparse finite mixture and those data give a big emphasis or big uh, posterior probability on, on, no, on no switching, so on, on the stability over the whole period. Uh, we don't, I don't have precise numbers. This on the right hand side is what you get with the Dirichlet process prior. And when you're dealing with empirical data, I mean, there's virtually no difference here. And this is what you obtain when you do marginal likelihood estimation. So kind of the me message for, for this example here is uh, you can do whatever you like. I mean, the, the results are fairly the same. The only thing you have to take care of is that with the marginal likelihood, you uh, allow overlapping mixtures. And when you use the sparse finite mixtures, uh, you have to make sure that uh, there are no o overlapping components here. So I guess I will skip um, this here <coughs> uh, because I still have like a five or six minutes uh, because I would like to uh, talk about the most recent work we have doing um, and this deals, uh, this is kind of an add-on so we are using sparse finite mixtures but we are introducing sparsity on an additional place. Um, and it, this comes under the term selection of cluster relevant uh, variables here. So again, let me start with, uh, with simulated data here. So uh, this is the, those are the, the, we have a mixture of four components. So this matrix has four columns in eight dimensions. Um, and when you look at those eight dimensions, there are only two dimensions where the, the means are actually different. So in, in six out of these eight dimensions, the, the data are homogeneous. So we have heterogeneity only in a, in a, in a few dimensions. Uh, what happens when you try to select the number of components and you can, can concentrate on the right-hand column here? where you use the marginal likelihood with the prior, which allows for overlapping components, uh, then you will see the marginal likelihood underfits the number of components. Uh, just choose two. And, and the reason is that uh, the, we allow for too much heterogeneity. We allow for heterogeneity in, in all dimensions here. So um, we have to, we, we overfit here the number of parameters which differ here. So uh, when we count how many parameters are different, it's only 14 instead of 32. So the, the marginal likelihood kind of uh, penalizes uh, that the, the components are not as different as we uh, allow the model to be. So we have been playing around with uh, taking uh, care of or including this information so again, sometimes it, it helps to be Bayesian and helps to include information. And the information we are now including is the structural information in the sense that we, there might be the dimensions where the, the, the means are not different, where we don't have heterogeneity. And the usual way to do this in variable selection, so this is kind of related to variable selection, is to use uh, sparsity priors, like the, uh, the lasso, which would be a Laplace prior, and in, in, in that paper, uh, we are using the normal gamma prior, which has been used for variable selection regression model by Tim Griffin um, and Phil Brown. So the, the sparsity prior here 
makes the, the prior variance uh, random by drawing this, the scale of the prior uh, from a hyperparameter here. So let me show you what a, such a sparsity prior looks like. So we are using the normal gamma, with it, which is this dash dotted line. You see the normal gamma in comparison to, to the, the normal, the standard normal distribution. So this would be the standard prior here. And we are using this dash dotted line. So you see there is high probability for, uh, for values close to zero. And then you have uh, pretty fat tails. So what the sparsity prior does is to learn the scale, because this, we have a prior here, so we can do Bayesian inference. We learn about the scale of the prior. And what happens? So we allow that in certain dimensions, so the earliest dimension here, we allow the model to learn from the data that in certain dimension, the variance of this prior is small. And what this means is that the the, the, the means in the various components are pulled towards um, a homogeneous mean, whereas in other dimension we allow the model to learn from the data that the prior variance is large, uh, which allows the component-specific means to be different in that dimension. So we kind of learn in which dimensions we have homogeneity and in which dimensions we have heterogeneity. So I guess I skip this and go go directly to to the results we have in that paper with uh, Gertrud Valli and, and Bettina Grün. So um, there is something which we don't understand at the moment. Uh, we found in, in the case where we use this sparsity prior based on the normal gamma prior that it's preferable to fix the parameter E0 in the Dirichlet prior, which uh, controls the degrees of sparsity with respect to the, the number of components, to keep that fixed in, instead of learning this from the data. So maybe we're, we still have to figure out how to do, maybe we need a different way to learn the degree of sparsity under, the, under a sparsity prior on the component means. So I'm going to compare the top of this table. You have seen this before uh, with the bottom of the table here, where we use the sparsity prior. And I would like to draw your attention to the, to the last column here. So we, we have the sparsity prior, so we learn the, the number of components. And you see the effect of using a sparsity prior here, because uh, the, uh, the data were simulated in such a way that we have um, two dimensions where there is no heterogeneity. You see um, a considerable uh, increase in uh, statistical efficiency. So this is the mean squared error of the component specific means and you get a much uh, precise solution here using the, using the sparsity prior. And this is for, the, for this other case study where we have this, uh, this simulation study where we have unequal weights and in this case the increase in accuracy of estimating uh, the component specific means. So we are, as I said before, in economic applications, we are actually interested in learning uh, this means. So we want to make sure that the mean squared error is as small as possible. And we see that the sparsity prior helps a lot to improve this efficiency here. And there's one other thing when you use the, the sparsity prior, you can look at the posterior distribution of these variances, as I explained in the beginning. Uh, if those variances are equal to zero, then you learn from the data that in this dimension um, the data are homogeneous. So here you see again the, the values that choose for simulation. Dimension three and four are the same in, in, all, um, in all groups. They are equal to zero. It doesn't matter whether it's zero, it could be anything else. So when we look at the posterior distribution of the, the scale, of the dimension specific scale, we actually learn that in dimension three and four, there is no heterogeneity, whereas in dimension one and two, obviously, uh, the, the component means are heterogeneous. And apart from that, we have this increase in, in efficiency. So oh, this, is, uh, this is, again, the, uh, the crop data, where we, again, select the true number of components. And also, in this case, uh, we observe a, a quite an increase in, uh, in mean squared error when we do the estimation here. Okay, so 
let me come to, to my uh, concluding uh, remark. I hope you learned from, from this lecture that you shouldn't be, you should uh, pay attention to, when you do a Bayesian approach, pay attention to the, the Dirichlet prior you use in finite mixture modeling. You have to decide whether you want to have sparse components, then you should use the, the number of non-empty components as estimator, or when you want to do reversible jump MCMC, then you have to make sure for the cho choice of the hyper prior that you allow for duplicated components. Um, there is little difference to directly to infinite mixtures, which are more very elegant from a mathematical point of view, but in terms of practical data analysis, there seems to be little practical difference to directly process prior. And the last line is the, are the plans for the for the future. Um, I, plan to look at more general mixer models and in particular at time series models and it's still an open issue how to consider sparse Markov switching models for instance. Okay, thank you. You can ask in French and she will translate and I will answer in English. <laughs> But there's a difference, like I understand some French, but I'm not able to speak French, so this is... Um, I have a question. In fact, it seems that finally all this parameter can be looked at as a turning parameter. It's a, it's a tuning parameter, you mean the E0? You know, yeah. from a practical point of view. Yeah. So it could be amazing. But maybe at, at the slide 40, 45. Yeah, no. You're for referring to a table, or? No, no. I, I mean, when you consider that there is a possibility to assume homogeneity against heterogeneity, I think this is probably the, I don't remember the, yeah, a lot of, indeed, no? This one? Uh, yes. Yeah. But the, when you consider, uh, I'm not sure if it's, it's making sense to, to take a lambda small. When, the, when, when you consider that the, the mean are equal, yes, are not depending on the, on the group, I, I think it's not really uh, making sense to consider uh, a lambda small. Well, the idea is that I don't know in which dimensions the means are equal and in which dimension they are not. I mean, in particular in higher dimensions, I mean, you could play around and work with a mixture where you fix two uh, mixture components to be equal and then do mar mar marginal likelihood estimation or things like this. So, so this is um, a way to um, allow the model to learn which dimension are homogeneous. So when, when the lambda is small, then so K is the, the a group indicator and L is the dimension. So L is fixed for each dimension L I have this prior here. And if the, the uh, L-specific variance, lambda L, is small, then in this dimension, every mean is equal to ML. And I have, of course, a hyper prior on ML. So I'm learning ML as well. So I'm learning kind of, I'm learning the center of the means, and I'm learning the variance. I mean, this is probably one way to, to do it. I mean, there might be different, maybe there are other ways to, formulate a prior which is flexible enough to uh, to allow for homogeneity and heterogeneity at the same time. Here, L is a dimension. L is the dimension. I do it in every dimension. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I want to say that if you take lambda L small, it means that you will uh, you will not se select at the end, you will not select this dimension. If lambda L is small, um, it, it means that 
and learn from the data that in this dimension there is no difference between the groups. Yeah. yeah. But it's a prior, so. so oh, it's a hierarchical prior. I, I learned from the data. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, it's a hierarchical prior. It's, it's ah, like the shrinkage well, okay, prior. Okay. Yeah, it's it's like I mean it's probably it's kind of <laughs> unusual. People know this from variable selection regression models. Okay, okay. So it's prior. It's like the lasso. No, oh, but we are using the normal gamma. The normal gamma even has more sparsity than the lasso, and the lasso is known to to yield biased estimators, where the normal gamma avoids avoid the bias here. But this is kind of those for the mean. You, you have this sparsity prior, and you learn, you learn whether they are different or whether they are concentrated here. Yeah. Okay. And actually, so they, what happens in uh, usually you run some results with the graph data, but graph data are quite simple, more or less. Yeah. But I use some experience with more uh, real data set with uh, higher dimension and where the where it is difficult to find some uh, some some group, some prior group, you know. And, and what do you think? What happens in such a case when the, I mean, when the uh, model is not is not true, definitively not true. Uh, we, yeah, yeah. It's difficult to uh, we looked also at the text textile, so there are these texture data. Mm -hmm. We looked at the texture data. Yeah. Uh, I think we put this into the paper. Um, we had some some problems with MCMC convergence for the for the yes. texture data. This is what, what I remember. Yeah. And by the way, you have a paper on your talk. There is a, a paper related to your talk. Oh. Uh, have you uh, published? So you mean the, yes. the, the 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 paper with Bettina? This one, yes. yeah, it's yes. just we just submitted it, so it's not it, published it's yet. It's, it, we submitted the paper, yeah, yeah. So we we'll see what the referee thinks about this. So maybe they say this is rubbish. I don't know yet. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, I wonder. Uh, I think that in many cases, when analyzing uh, uh, data um, coming from marketing problems, for instance, there, there is some uh, available expertise. Uh, uh, and um, are there any um, uh, any papers dealing uh, explicitly uh, in, uh, within this context in how to make uh, informative prior from, from available expertise? Or uh, if not, do you think uh, it's um, it's a relevant way, perspective I mean, there are many applications of finite mixture models in marketing. I mean, there's this, this book by Peter Rossi, Greg Allenby, I don't know if you know that book, so they, they work a lot with finite mixture models. Um, I still have to apply the, the idea of sparse finite mixtures in marketing. So we have a couple of marketing data. And, and we plan to look into this. But when you want to learn about how to use finite mixtures in marketing, I would really recommend the, the book by Peter Rossi. Basin, I think it's Basin Methods in Marketing, and you will find a lot of useful references there. Okay. Merci beaucoup.